be 5.30. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, we are at the uh, City Hall Council Chambers at 10 West State Street. Today's date's June 14, 2021. Time is 5.30 p.m. We are calling this meeting to order, and to do that, I give a notice to the public that the mayor and council welcome comment from the public during discussion of any of the items that are on the agenda. You have to step to the mic, state your name and address for the record, and limit your time to three minutes or less so others may be given the opportunity to speak. Please speak clearly and direct your comments to the, com to the mayor and council and not to any counselor specifically. It's at the discretion of the mayor and council to respond to specific uh, questions and comments or to have staff respond during the meeting. Would those who are able please uh, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Uh, let's call the roll, please. Gowdy? Here. Hoop? Here. Isom? Lottiehoff? Here. Martin? Here. Thompson? Here. Warren? Here. Very good. Full house, and uh, we're getting back to some semblance of normalcy. Uh, it, it's now time for Mayor, Council, and Administrator comments. Uh, does anyone on the Council have any comments to make? Madam Administrator, how about you? None tonight, Your Honor. Okay, and then under Mayor comments, I uh, uh, apologize if I've done this in the past, but there's a note up here to uh, thank Mary Stevens for over 21 years of service on the Civil Service Commission. Uh, she started back on April 10 of 2000 and uh, has uh, been with us up to June 14 of 2021. These commissions are important. Uh, and there are people that have been serving on uh, many of them for many years. Some require ex expertise in different areas of uh, experience, others do not, uh, but all require time and energy, and so we appreciate the fact that people are willing to, uh, to uh, serve. We're up to that time then, then for the consent agenda item F. Is there a motion to approve? Your Honor, before you ask for that, you may. <coughs> I'd like to pull number nine and number 16, please. Okay. I move for approval, leaving out number nine and 16. Second. Very good. Let's uh, go ahead and call the roll on that, and then we'll read those. Hoop? Yes. Lottiehoff? Yes. Martin? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Weirin? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Very good. Those have carried. When able, please read those items. Approve the minutes from the May 24th, 2021 meeting and a bill list in the amount of $3,325,546.01. The civil service hire list for a police officer. Appoint Chris Bennett to the Civil Service Commission. Appoint Gabe Isom as the council alternate on the executive board of the Solid Waste Management Commission. Approval of the renewal applications for State of Iowa retail cigarette, tobacco, nicotine, and vapor licenses through June 30th of 22 for Eastside Liquor and Grocery at 1116 East Nevada Street, Jiffy Store 922 at 111 South 3rd Avenue, Seven Rayos, Rayos Liquor Store at 120 East Main Street, Get and Go Store number 34 at 3302 South Center Street, Get and Go Store number 35 at 902 Lincoln Way, Quick Store store number 394 at 2500 south center street quick star number 607 at 814 south 6th street quick star number 607 at 810 south third avenue liquor and grocery depot at 114 north center street hyvee inc at 802 south center street hyvee gas at 808 south center street vons pub at 22 north first avenue Golden Asian Golden Land Asian Food Inc. at 11 East State Street. Approval of liquor license renewals for Zamora Fresh Market at 4 East Main Street. Elmwood Country Club at 1734 Country Club Lane. JB Bar at 915 Turner Street. Trima on Main at 20, 22 to 26 West Main Street. Marshall Beer Wine and Spirits at 11 North 3rd Avenue. High V Gas at 808 South Center Street. Resolution allowing open containers on public ways for a neighborhood block party. 
Resolution accepting the award terms and conditions for the coronavirus local fiscal recovery funds from the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Resolution approving an agreement per for professional services with Clap Saddle Garber Associates, Inc. for the UPH Secondary Access Street Project in the City of Marshalltown, Iowa in the amount of $55,200. Resolution approving contract change order number two for the East Main Street Drainage Improvements Project number SMW20004, an increase of $10,094.10. Resolution approving engineer's statement of completion accepting the Construct Inc. East Main Street Drainage Improvements Project being project number SMW20004 with a final project cost in the amount of $159,143. Resolution approving the Title VI agreement with the insurance and assurances for the City of Marshalltown. Resolution approving a 28E interagency agreement between the Iowa Department of Inspections and Appeals and the City of Marshalltown. Agreement expires August 22nd of 2022. Resolution approving a six-month extension of time to complete the facade grant work for 32 East Main Street and 8 North 1st Avenue. And resolution approving a contract with Dan's Overhead Doors for $299,554 to complete the work at the Marshalltown Airport funded by insurance proceeds. Very good, thank you. Let's uh, then approach uh, the two items taken out of there. Number nine was the first one. Would anybody like to make a motion to approve it or comment on why it was removed? I move for approval. Okay. Second. Second. Okay, uh, time for discussion. Your Honor, if I may. You may. <coughs> As you know, I've, I've tried several times unsuccessfully to um, bring this money back into the city coffers, which is allowed by state law. Tonight, I won't beat that dead horse, um, but at the very least, I'd like to offer up an argument that it's my understanding the city administrator is going to come to us in the near future with a budget shortfall in the general fund. Um, Therefore, if we amend this agreement with the Convention and Visitors Bureau and take it back down to the minimum requirement by state law that we grant them 50% of the proceeds rather than the 67%, that should put, did I get that percentage right, Jessica? You did. Okay, so that should put $68,000 back into the general fund that we can use to offset a portion of that shortfall. And I've got to believe with the continued growth of the construction workers coming to town and doing more post derecho work that the motels are going to be full to capacity this summer. So I don't think the impact will really be a true $68,000 to the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, so I would move that we amend this to be to change the amount to 50% instead of 67%. There is a motion to amend on the floor. Is there a second to that motion? Hearing none, uh, let's go on with uh, further discussion by the council or public. Tell me when we're muted, unmuted, or rather. We are unmuted. Thank you. I think I read that the uh, city council down in Des Moines is going back to in-person meetings um, with extra security and that sort of thing. I can see the day coming for us to do that. And so let's go unmuted for about uh, 15 seconds. Got another five to go. We'll call time. Roll call. Lottie Hoff? Yes. Martin? What are we voting on, please? Uh, this is the resolution itself, number nine. Resolution itself? Yes, sir. Yes. Thompson? No. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Okay, that one carried. Let's go on to number 16 then. Is there a motion to approve number 16? So moved, Your Honor. Is there a second? Second, Your Honor. I guess for the public, we should read what that resolution is, please. 
Resolution setting a public <coughs> hearing for the conveyance and transfer of title of lot one and lot two of the Vallejo Bluffs first edition herein described from the city of Marshalltown, Iowa to the Iowa River Hospice Inc. Okay, time for discussion. That was pulled again. Your Honor, if I may. You may. I was asked by a member of the the citizens of Marshtown to poll this. They, uh, they would like to make a comment on this. Well, let's go in the regular order of uh, first inviting counselors to comment, and then we'll open it up to the public. Any counselor wish to speak? Not hearing anybody jump up to the mic. Let's go ahead and open uh, the lines on mute for 15 seconds, and uh, the mic Thanks is open. Unmuted. Mark Eaton, 1007 South 10th Avenue. I just want to mention for the record that we're selling this property for $26,687 per acre to the hospice house, and I support them fixing our shortfall, maybe. Any other public comment? Uh, let's keep the mics open for another 10 seconds. Uh, let's call the roll. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Vladihoff? Yes. Martin? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Very good. That one carried as well as good item G. Resolutions, would you read the first one for us, please? Yes. The following resolutions are regarding the plat of the Viejo Bluffs First Edition <sighs> Subdivision. First resolution, accepting quick claim deed relating to the Viejo Bluffs First Edition. Vote for approval. Thank you. Second. Well, let's discuss. Michelle Sponheimer, Housing Community Development Director. Um, the Viejo Bluffs uh, First Edition is a subdivision of the parcel of land that the city acquired in order to build uh, uh, East Merle Hibbs Boulevard. And so it's just a creation of those two lots and the parcel of roadway. Um, so these are the final documents that would allow for those uh, lots to actually be created and recorded. Any questions or comments for Michelle? Any questions or comments from the council? Well, let's unmute the mics and see if there are any questions or comments from the public. Are unmuted. Let's, go, let's, let's go 10 this time. <coughs> Sounded like somebody sneezed, but wasn't trying to get our attention, so let's call the roll. Hoop? Yes. Lottie Hoff? Yes. Martin? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Very good, that resolution carried. Let's go on to the second one. Resolution approving final plat for the Viejo Bluffs first edition. Move for approval, Your Honor. Thank you. Second, second Your Honor. Well, let's go loud a half on the tie. Um, comments or questions, discussion? Well, let's open the mics, 10 seconds. Lines are unmuted. Two, one, zero, vote. Martin? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Weirin? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Lottie Hoff? Yes. Carried as well. On to the third and last resolution, please. <coughs> resolution accepting dedication of Viejo Bluffs First Edition in the town of Marshall, Marshall County, Iowa. I move for approval. Second, Your Honor. Thank you. Any discussion here? How about unmute for 10? They're unmuted, Your Honor. <coughs> This may set a record for the fastest we've been through a regular, uh, the regular items on the agenda before the discussion items. So let's call a roll call on this one. Thompson? Yes. Weirin? Yes. 
Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Lottie Hoff? Yes. Martin? Yes. Very good. That carried as well. On to the next item, which is discussion items. The first of which is to discuss the community development block grant application on behalf of MICA. Yes, I will uh, go ahead and introduce uh, Clarissa Thompson with MICA and Marty Wymore with Region 6, if he's going to perhaps participate at some point. Um, Marty had reached out to me by email to inquire about uh, the city's participation as a lead applicant for a community development block grant on behalf of MICA, and Clarissa is here to tell you more about that project. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Um, like Jessica said, my name is Clarissa Thompson. I'm the Executive Director of Mid-Iowa Community Action. I'm just very glad to be with you all tonight. I um, just want to give a little bit of background. I mean, there's so much we could talk about with MICA, just to give you a, a little in-depth of what we're working on. Um, MICA has operated in Marshalltown and surrounding communities for over 55 years and is focused on helping people affected by the conditions of poverty change their lives. And I've left an annual report with Jessica to share with you all that gets into a little bit more details on agency statistics. But why we're here tonight is about a building. Uh, we purchased a building located at 204 South First Ave in October of 2019. This facility will become the new home for most of our direct services with families. The site will be home to over 30 staff members serving hundreds of individuals in a given year in over 10 or more program areas. And these areas include energy assistance, the WIC program, Head Start, and disaster assistance as needed. <coughs> our services vary and are most effective when our staff, those we serve, and our community partners can work together collaboratively and effectively. This facility is aligning a greater mission of the idea of having one location for families to join with MICA staff to achieve stability, security, and success. This idea has been a long-term goal, and after we lost the facility in the 2018 tornado and has significantly outgrown our South 2nd Street location, we are grateful to have found and purchased this location and the building of our size to move forward. And we do appreciate the council's consideration of pursuing a CDBG grant to support these efforts. One of the reasons that we are here is the total project budget um, after the purchase of the building and including in a farm, fire alarm is around $2,081,000. As I talked about earlier, Head Start is one of our programs that would be located in this facility. There are processes that Head Start has um, in place that have not approved uh, mortgage payments um, US-wide. It's just not our program, it's just not in Iowa, it's US-wide. However, they have funding, which would allow us to apply for and move forwards. But that's been a huge delay for us, and the delay has caused us problems of getting started. The good news is that we also received some um, funding through the last um, American Recovery Act, that we are purposing for Head Start portion. So the CD, CDBG opportunity and what we have for funding should cover most of Head Start's expenses and we will continue to apply for those extra funds at Head Start. I know this sounds very complicated, trust me, I live with it every day. But the longer we wait, um, we have just added costs for an empty facility and our model of service delivery is just being on hold. And it's complicated for our families and our staff. So with that, I would um, entertain questions and invite Marty to share. Marty Wymore with Region 6 uh, Resource Partners here in Marshalltown. So the CWG program is a federal grant th through the state of Iowa, and uh, cities and counties are the only eligible applicants for this fund, so MICA isn't an eligible applicant. They are an eligible subrecipient. So under this uh, particular grant, then the city would be the applicant, and then the city of Marshalltown, after any grant award, would enter into a subrecipient agreement with MICA, and most of the federal responsibilities then would be part of uh, MICA's responsibility with this project. So again, this would be a, an application by the city for 500000 and obviously the city has overall responsibilities, but most of the responsibilities transfer on to MICA. 
uh, to complete the application. You know, the city has to go through some steps. I would anticipate those uh, to happen in late July and August. And then the city would uh, compete with other cities under 50,000 in population for these phones. Thanks, Marty. Any questions or comments by any counselors? Mr. Wymore, who, oh, over here. Sure, sure. Who will be the primary writer of the grant? I mean, do we need to put our staff in that spot or, I mean, Ms. Uh, Thompson? That, that's, you? Guess, that's me. Yeah, okay. Right, right. I'll <laughs> okay. be taking care of that responsibility to move forward with this project, so. Okay, great. Thank you. Your, Your Honor. Honor. Go ahead. Your Honor. Yes. Um, first of all, for the record, you and I, there's no relation that we know of, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just for the record. No, no conflict of interest here. Um, uh, <coughs> is the parking sufficient on that lot? I mean, will you be paving that gravel lot? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so you'll be cleaning up the site? Yes. Okay. I actually have a, a photo I could pass around I, that kind of shows, again, this is planning and last minute changes could occur, but you're more than welcome to take a look at that. But yeah, there would be significant oh, wow. paving. And um, we'd also have a playground on the area because we would be a Head Start facility and plenty of parking for staff and those that are visiting. For those on the phone or computer, the question was about parking and there will be adequate parking. And then later you'll kick uh, Mike Bashong out of his building and take that over? Thank you, Clarissa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. You bet. Let's, uh, unless the other counselor has any questions or comments, let's open it up to the public and unmute. Oops. No. Oops. The lines are unmuted. Thank you. Mark Eaton, 1007 South 10th Avenue. Uh, Micah does a good job, good work, good, good goals, all that. I support that, but uh, M, uh, community block grants, um, we could be using those for downtown to save buildings and to restore buildings like the one on 2nd Avenue maybe. And so we're basically taking taxpayer money and giving it to a nonprofit where if they have donors, donors can give to them and make up the shortfall. And we've got a, a large number of donors in Marshalltown and they get tax writers write-offs for doing that. So I don't know why we need to give taxpayer money to a nonprofit. Thank you. Um, one, one clarification just to make so that you all know, the reason this is on the agenda is because we were not planning on uh, submitting a public facilities grant which um, there are multiple types of community development block grants. Public facilities is one of them. We actually will be submitting a um, downtown revitalization grant, which is also a community development block grant. Um, so there's a whole bunch of these community development block grants for sewer, water, and other things um, that are kind of all due at the same time. Um, we can't submit two in the same category. So if uh, Micah was looking at a downtown revitalization grant, then we would have a conflict but because they're two separate categories, there is no conflict with our downtown revitalization grant or Micah's um, uh, request here. And your honor? Yes. And then what I heard you say is then that 500,000, Micah is gonna make that donation back to us over the next 10 years for fireworks? <laughs> is that what I heard you say? <laughs> <laughs> nope, no? that is not oh, what was okay. said. All right. It's tough getting old with our hearing, I, I recognize. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions or comments by the council before we tr uh, invite the public comment? I don't think we unmuted, did we? Oh. We, we are unmuted. We are unmuted. Yes. Uh, let's give people about another five seconds. Your Honor. Yes, sir. Got a question for Jessica. Go for it. Are we in danger of getting any, getting close to any limits? to what we can apply for or what we're going to use, utilize in federal funds? Um, no, I mean, so I, the way that I've been looking at this is that we have FEMA funds ongoing, so we're gonna be over that federal single audit level, if that's kind of where you were going in terms okay. of 
funds. So we would already be there uh, partially too because we have the lead grant as well. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it would probably have a 30, I think the fee for this year was $3,400 for a single or for an audit of a program. So there would be an audit fee down the road because any federal funds coming in would be audited. Okay. I think that's enough for public comment as well. Do you need any uh, direction? Yeah, I think for the record, we would just like it to direct staff to work with Region 6 and MICA to facilitate um, a public facilities community development block grant application. So moved. Second. Okay. We've had discussion. Let's go ahead and vote. Hoop. Yes. Yes. Lottie Hoff? Yes. Martin? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Weirin? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Very good. Before going on to the next item, I have to, I just have to uh, comment that just like with Youth and Shelter Services here next door is one of those nonprofits that's done so much for the community. Uh, those of us in city government were um, required to recognize just how helpful MICA was after our tornado and after the derecho. And so uh, as long as you're here, we just have to publicly thank you because we recognize uh, just what you've done. And then Marty Weimar, next to Michelle Sponheimer, is the uh, grant writer extraordinaire for Marshall County. And so we appreciate the good work you always do for us too, Marty. Thank you. Let's go on to number two, which is the Fisher Community Center land purchase proposal. Would you like to lead us off? Um, actually, Your Honor, there are three items related to the F Fisher Community Center. The first one is the governance. Um, and uh, there isn't a memo with that, but there is the code of ordinances uh, uh, section, which creates the community center board of trustees, and then a current list of who those trustees are. Um, one thing that I will um, share up front with all of these is that I am on the Fisher Governor Foundation board of trustees. The Fisher Governor Foundation owns the Fisher Community Center. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, from an internal perspective, but Carol Hibbs, who is also on the uh, Fisher Governor Foundation board of trustees, I think are you the uh, vice, vice president um, of that group is here to speak to these items specifically. Okay, thank you. Um, I will provide introduction here just, um, you know, with the, the uh, there's a lot of history that goes into the conversation about any of this. Um, the Fisher, um, Fisher uh, Community Center Board of Trustees um, was originally stab established back in the late uh, 1960s. And it was really, as you can tell from the ordinance language, um, governing the, the arts. Um, there was at one time then a municipal art gallery that was uh, by ordinance as well that has since gone away. And so uh, we have been um, uh, basically having this board of trustees that has existed uh, for quite some time. Um, one of the things that uh, I would like to, you know, I, I feel like I've said this many times, not with just this one specifically, but other some boards and commissions that we've um, removed here over the last few years is that uh, there really is not a great line of communication between the city and this board or there hasn't really been in the past other than kind of those annual reports to the council and what we lose control of there and take on liability for is open meetings and open records because this board is basically it's a publicly created board and it has to comply with those um, those open uh, meetings laws and open records laws and because we don't really have access to those things um, it, in really sort of controlling those things it does uh, open us up uh, for some liability and so um, I'd say one of the goals that I've looked at um, since I started was really getting our boards and commissions down to a level where they make sense for what we have, what we're legally required to have, but also then what we're overseeing and what we truly can manage as a city. So uh, I will leave it with, with that and turn it over to Carol if there's anything to share on this one. Carol Hibbs, uh, 2005 Elmcrest Drive. Um, as Jessica mentioned, I'm on the Fisher Governor Foundation Board. Uh, it's a structure that has um, changed over the years, and uh, the operation of the center has changed over the years from what it was originally in, uh, intended. And so 
Uh, we feel that this is just an updating um, along with several other uh, steps as included on the agenda that needs to happen um, so that we can move forward. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, I know you've, you've all uh, received information on it, and so I don't want to go through everything in your packet again, but um, I'd be happy to answer questions. Are there any questions or comments for Carol? Your Honor, if I may? You may. Carol, I'm a little confused. Um, I know this was originally set up early, well, what, late 60s. Okay. Mm -hmm. So lots changed, yeah, yeah lots yeah. changed since then. Um, what, what makes a board, and this is a really stupid question, what makes a board overseeing the Fisher Community Center, as it's labeled now, what makes that the community center board? I mean, things have changed. I mean, could we not have a board, a community center board over the Coliseum or other um, or exactly the city things in town? I mean, what, what designates the Fisher Community Center in today's world as the community center? The, probably the, the title, the name of the, yeah. the facility. But it's not city owned. No, it is not city owned. And so that's where this really gets into. You have a city created board overseeing a property that is owned by another entity. And, uh, and so that's where it's, it, it does get a, a little tricky. It's much easier of a conversation about um, city owned facilities and things. And so that's where the proposal here is to remove the city from any sort of governance of a non city owned facility. This, this uh, new proposed structure should be a benefit to the city. Is this the only board we have that has interest in a non-city owned entity? As, as far as I can think right now off the top of my head, yes, okay. that, would be, that would be the case. Yeah, I'm just curious. I, mean, I realize, you know, I understand the intent when it started. Mm -hmm. I just want to clarify where we're at what, 70, 60 years later. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Well, we're in a structure that really doesn't work all that well. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. Jessica, thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Anyone else? Should we unmute and open the mic? The lines are unmuted. Okay. Mark Eaton, 1007 South 10th Avenue. So according to Iowa Code 384.12, uh, sections 11 and 12, um, it basically this refers to us taxing for the maintenance, which we've been paying for since Monsanto bought Fisher Governor. So when before that, the Fisher Governor Foundation paid for everything, but when Monsanto bought them, then the city started paying the maintenance on this building, 1969. Uh, anyways, uh, 11 says a city, if a city has entered into a lease of a building or complex of, a build, of buildings to be operated as a civic center, a tax sufficient to pay the installations of rent, um, installation, sorry, installments of rent and or maintenance, insurance and taxes, not including this lease. Okay, so I assume this is what we're operating on since we're taxing the people to pay them $100,000 a year for maintenance. But I don't know of any lease. That's my question. Second, it says we can tax up to 13 and a half cents if we actually own the building, but we don't own the building. That's been made clear. So um, do we have this lease? And so we're really the taxpayer in control of the facility through the lease and we can decide who is in the building, what nonprofits have offices, things like that. That's not really, that's not controlled by, <coughs> that should be controlled by us, not by some other people, uh, like a board. So that's my question. 
Yeah, to, to be clear, I, I don't know if you all remember this. During budget time, as we were talking about the tax levy specifically, you know, the Fisher Community Center has been vacant since August, and we had that conversation about whether or not to consider the levy moving forward. That did happen. So there was a modified lease that was put in place um, back, I think, in February. And so it was just in recent years that we did not have leases moving forward. Um, and so that was the thing of looking at this was, does the city really need to have a board to govern um, our contribution to a non-city owned civic center or does having a strong contract in place that governs what uh, the rent or what the funds are to be used for which is specifically for the use of the facility um, for uh, free of service for service clubs nonprofits once per month and so that's really what that's outlined I can definitely email that all to you here um, probably just shortly if I can find it um, but we do have a lease in place and that was really the purpose of you know do you need a board if you have a lease that controls your your funds um, going into the facility thanks so let's leave the mics open another five seconds Okay. Uh, do you need staff direction on this one as well? Your yeah. Honor, if, oh. if I may ask a follow-up question. You may. Jessica, what's our lease in place? What are we leasing? We, we are leasing the facility for the free use of the nonprofits um, on an annual basis. So, yeah, if, uh, that is, that's out there. Um, we discussed it in February. Right. It was one that um, is a little bit different right now. I think that lease was to uh, uh, acknowledge that there is no current occupancy and that the Fish and Governor Foundation cannot provide um, what we're leased for, but we're continuing to make those payments to them. Under that, your definition of a lease then, then do we set a does do we set it or does the board set it how often a nonprofit can use those facilities um i i'm going to try and find that here because i believe it is actually stated in i believe it is actually stated in there what it is how often that is so it's a contractually agreed to thing So your, your opinion is that since that lease of us controlling the meeting rooms and their use, that, I don't know the right word, the right word to use, um, that, that qualifies under the law that Mr. Eaton just read, that that gives us the right to, to tax the taxpayers to send $100,000 to a private entity. Uh, yeah, to a, a non-city-owned a non right. civic center, yeah. yes. And while you're looking for that, um, this Chapter 31, this Board of Community Center Trustees, is that something that's looking, is that state or is that, a, that's us, right? Yeah, that's a locally created ordinance. Is that, is that on your radar to be rewritten? So the, I, I guess I should have probably included a memo to be very clear about the request. The request is for the city to delete that ordinance and to delete that as a uh, board and commission of the city altogether. And so that's what's before you tonight. The Fisher Governor Foundation has established a board of trustees as the building owner, which is effectively performing the same duties um, at, yeah, as the city created board. It does not seem like we need to have two. Um, actually, I was wrong. It was in December of 2020 that we had a modification of the Fisher Community Center lease agreement. And, in, and it says at the top, whereas public use was defined in the lease agreement as use on a monthly basis by local service organizations and clubs, public schools, veterans organizations, and other nonprofit entities. And so the, the, what was approved in December was basically setting forth that they could not provide those services at this point in time, um, but that we were going to continue the payments. But my, my concern was more that it, it I, that's what I was listening for, was that one month, once a month, we'd, somebody couldn't camp out and take over a room. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then um, what, what's the process if we eliminate that, that section of the ordinances? Is there three readings on taking an ordinance out? 
Yeah, it's, so it would be repealing, repealing an existing ordinance. The public hearing and the whole bit, right? I don't believe a public hearing would be required on this one since it is just a locally created ordinance. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. You bet. And back to the question, do you need any action item on this? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Is there a motion to approve going forward with that change in ordinances? I move for approval. Second. We've had enough discussion, I think. Let's go ahead and call the roll. Hoop. Yes. Lottie Hoff? Yes. Martin? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Very good. That carried as well. Staff has this direction on to the discussion, the next discussion item, which is the Fisher Community Center land purchase proposal. Yes, so in the, the again, the realm of um, things that happened a long time ago, which um, complicate situations today, um, many might not know this, but the um, land in which uh, both the Y Cultural Center and the Fisher Community Center um, actually is owned uh, by the Iowa <coughs> DOT. There's approximately 6.3 acres um, that the Fisher Community Center sits on and four acres that the YMCA Cultural Center sits on. And so as we, it was actually back in 2017 um, that I reached out to see what the DOT's interest was in this land. Um, of course, they really didn't have a, um, a a, a knowledge of it because it was just excess right-of-way that was acquired um, many many years ago I believe for uh, Highway 14 and so um, there's a little bit of history there of how we came to be involved with it um, as a governmental entity uh, we function with the DOT in a way that a nonprofit or a private entity cannot and so ultimately the, the lease was done with the city um, in 1955 uh, for $3,000 with the uh, Fisher Foundation immediately paying the $3,000 to the city for then a sublease um, of the uh, of the property and so um, so that's kind of where all that happened in 1955 to lead to the, de the to the building of the Fisher Community Center um, and kind of went from there what we've been able to ascertain is that the lease with the Fisher or Fisher Foundation at the time was for the entire 10 acre parcel um, and that it did not split off you know the the Y area and that there was a later action by the Fisher Foundation to sublease the portion uh, to the YMCA um, there we can find I know records that that was something that the city blessed or that the DOT had to bless or anything and so that that sort of happened so um, we have uh, finally heard back from the DOT um, about uh, some different paths forward in which uh, there there is some um, there's there's some things that the DOT has to do under Iowa code related to unused or excess right-of-way and so we, we requested that the DOT do an appraisal on the land as it is, as well as then an appraisal on what it would be to uh, do an additional for the purchase of the land and then an appraisal for a lease, another 99 year lease to see uh, which option made the most sense. Um, when they came back with that, uh, the option that made the most sense was um, a price, an appraisal price of $44,000 for the 6.3 acres in which the Fisher Community Center sits on. And so um, as this is unused right of way, they have a process to go through if we give them the thumbs up um, which and make the formal request, uh, which is they have to um, try to uh, notify the original owners um, who would then have the ability to purchase back at the original or at the new um, fair market value. Uh, they believe that these owners are deceased. Um, and so once they can confirm that, then uh, they can offer it to us as the local government. Um, if we decide not to, then basically they put it out to an auction. Um, but once we start down this path, they put it out to an auction if we are still not there. So it's then um, not keeping that land really in sort of a known control. And so, um, so really that's re where we stand at this point. They did advise that they needed a, um, uh, the mayor to submit a letter 
um, authorizing uh, the acquisition of the 6.3 acres for 44,000. Um, the thing that was communicated to me, which I included in this and Carol can speak to more, was that the Fisher Governor Foundation would then, very much like in 1955, offer the $44,000 to um, pay for the land, which is a fair market value. So therefore that transaction could take place without having to do a bid process. So a lot of things to, to digest there with the land, um, but ultimately uh, we would like to see the DOT out of all of the land, including the Y land as well. And so that would be a process that if uh, you would approve of this one, then we would start to move down that process with working with the Y um, to try and help them obtain ownership of their land as well. Carol Hips, 2005 Elmcrest Drive. So um, I'm here to answer questions, but uh, historically this has been um, kind of a, a, a process to sort through uh, the ownership and the history on the land and uh, how we got to where we are today, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have um, to the best of my ability. Any questions or comments by the council? The plan would be, as Jessica mentioned, for the Fisher Governor Foundation Board to purchase the land um, through the city. Your Honor, Carol, just the 6.3 acres. Correct. So, Jessica, where does this leave the why? If the original owners are dead, yes. that means I can go to the courthouse and file to take possession of this land? Um, so the DOT has communicated that they would like us to um, provide direction uh, about the why as well and so if uh, the direction was to move forward that there either need to be a new lease with the DOT for that um, or uh, an outright purchase either way they need to move down an appraisal process for that and so we would be seeking to do the same process as has been done with the Fisher Community Center uh, with the 4.3 acres on the north side of the creek as well for the YMCA. So as the director of the Y, I can also speak to the fact that um, the Y will be working through this process as well. Um, we are not in the same place as the Fisher Governor Foundation. Our, we have a board meeting next Monday. Um, so uh, we're exploring what the options are for the Y. One, which might be to keep it under lease with the DOT. I don't know if that's a possibility. Another one would be to come back and do the same process with the city at that time. And Carol, you understand the can of worms you're going to open here yes. once we take ownership of, if, if the mayor sends this letter yeah. and we purchase this property for 44000 you know, there's a lot of people who are going to come out of the woods that say, I want to bid on that property because I'm going to get a $7 million renovated building in 30 years. Mm -hmm. So 44000 is not going to buy this property once we own it. Well, so that would be the thing. That would be the city's decision of you. Basically, it's the same thing here. We could say we want to be in the position of it and then jack up the price and put it out to bid, um, which is a possibility. And as stewards um, of the taxpayer's money, we'd be negligent in our jobs to take 44000 for 6.3 acres with a $7 million renovated building. Well, and I think the, the point that um, has been made to me, and I don't know if it was made to all of you, is there would be no renovation of the Fisher Community Center if the city was not going to transfer the land. And I would, I would guess that there'd be no renovation of the Y Cultural Center if the, the city you, would not You might transfer. just own the Y if you did that. Um, so, so the renovation would only happen if we're able to um, purchase the land so at, if we, at the So if we purchase price. it, if we get it, you want to... Uh, codicil that says you get first right of refusal at the 44,000. For the Fisher Community Center. Right. Yes. Yes. I mean, that, that's part of how we will be able to um, do the renovation project. Wow. Other questions or comments by the council? If not, let's open it back up to the public. The lines are unmuted. Mark Eaton, 1007 <coughs> South 10th Avenue. 
So the city just sold a bunch of acres to Hospice House for $26,687 an acre. This property is 6.35 acres. I don't know what devalues it to $44,000 from the hospice house ground, which actually is not buildable. Um, so so I, I say this ground is worth $170,000. The Fisher Governor Foundation has $680,000 in a trust, in an investment fund with the Community Foundation of Marshall County. So they're not poor. I know they're probably going to use, they need all of it they can get for this renovation, but we still don't own the building and it's a nonprofit and they are renting space to other nonprofits in this building. So this, this land's worth $170,000. Let's keep the mics open another five. Okay. Staff direction required again? Yeah, um, so uh, here at the end of the memo um, that if, if you would like to, to move forward um, with uh, acquiring this land, the 6.3 acres from the DOT, um, the mayor does need to issue a letter uh, doing this. And so that's where I'd recommend a motion to um, uh, have staff prepare a letter for the mayor to sign to start this process. So moved. Uh, have a lot second. of help on the motion. Uh, Martin second. on the second. Thank you. Your Honor, may I ask one more question of Mrs. Hibbs, please? Quickly. Carol, you are so patient with me. So if something goes wrong in this polluted process with the DOT and everything, um, you guys would walk away from the Fisher Community Center? So the project's um, planning is based on a land purchase price of $44,000. Right. Um, it will be difficult to... Um, Invest that much for 30 more years, yes. not knowing the future, is yes. what you're saying? Yes. I'm sorry to put words in your mouth, but <laughs> that's where you were headed, right? Yes. yes. So then we'd have... So as the land sits now, you, we have a building that is not usable. Right. Um, and so we're um, working on getting a building that it would be a valuable community asset. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Roll call. Thompson? No. Weirin? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Ladihoff? Yes. Martin? Yes. Very good. That one carried as well. Staff has its direction on that one. And next item is the uh, Fisher Community Center Renovation CAT Grant. Yes. So um, one of the things that I have been trying to assist with is uh, grant applications and one application which we were not able to apply for for the Coliseum but is out there with a um, a July 15th uh, due date for newly allocated funds um, from this legislative session is the CAT grant or the um, community and tourism, uh, community attraction and tourism grant, uh, which is done by Enhance Iowa, um, which is part of the Iowa Economic Development Authority. And so um, I included the, uh, the uh, information here um, you're you cannot p apply for more than a million dollars and those projects that have received a million dollars are uh, typically in that 20 million plus investment range um, it's who's eligible to apply city county nonprofit this would be the Fisher governor foundation applying um, on their on their own um, range of awards between 10 and 10 and 20 percent and then when we get to uh, in order to apply, there has to be 65% um, of documented matching funds uh, in order to do that, which means that has to be in place by um, the uh, these, uh, 15th of July. 
And so then we get to a very interesting question here about what about funding um, from the city and the county? And it says the Enhanced Iowa Board requires cash contributions from the city and the county in which the project will be located. Uh, these can be done as multi-year pledges and must be documented in writing. And so um, if this is a grant that uh, the Fisher Governor Foundation is able to apply for, um, it is one that does require city support. Um, I included in my, my memo that uh, where I believe that support would be um, most logically come from at this point would be the uh, uh, local option sales tax uh, that is council designated and so um, it is one that uh, is truly up to you there's no set dollar amount there is no set percentage of that um, it doesn't say the city and the county have to be matching and so uh, what's here before you tonight is uh, a request to um, identify a dollar figure um, if you would so choose um, to allow which is required for the Fisher Governor Foundation to be able to apply for the CAT grant. Questions? Your Honor. Ms. Martin. To Jessica, <clears throat> has the county been approached for their uh, involvement in this program? I'll let Carol answer that. <laughs> back. It's a hot one. Um, so uh, they have, we have not met with them yet, but we have a meeting set up with them. Yes, they will be approached. Yeah. Okay. And um, just to give a little bit, I'm sure all of you are aware of this, uh, there's historical perspective. The, the Wise Horn Henry Center uh, was built with um, impartial CAT grant funding. Um, that includes city and county contributions, as well as library and um, some, some other projects in the community. So this is a funding stream that has been um, important to the community and, and getting um, some projects done in our community. And so we've seen a lot of benefit from accessing these funds. Okay, thank you. Your Honor. Yes, sir. Carol. Sorry. I wasn't quick enough. Do you remember what the fees or the amount were you, that you got for the Y? Um, the total amount of the grant for the Y was 3.2. No, the contribution from the, the city and the county. Um, I don't remember the breakdown <coughs> of okay. that. That was that was a number of years yeah. ago, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. But if you want me to look it up, I can for you. You don't need to. Other, well, let's open the mics if we haven't yet. The lines are unmuted. Thank you. Lee Botter, 401 Orchard Drive. Um, I don't have all the details, so I'd like to get some clarification as to, um, I'm hearing shortfall, and I'm hearing that it was a uh, one to two million from an insurance proceeds and possibly a, this project costing five to six million dollars. So my question is, who was responsible for insuring that building? I know the city, when we went through the tornado, we went through and dug into, and you guys as a city uh, and as council did a great job on insuring the city buildings. My question is who insured that building and who made the decisions so it's creating such a shortfall with insurance? Thank you. That's it, if you'd like to respond, Carol, you're welcome. Um, so there, uh, the building was insured, and there are insurance proceeds that have been used for the building. Um, what we're talking about doing, our total project, um, is the scope beyond what. Uh, the insurance proceeds are for because there's a considerable amount of improvements uh, that are inspect expected in the new project. So uh, it becomes above and beyond what the insurance proceeds are. Can you share what the proceeds were for that building, what it was insured for? I don't know that off the top of my head, Lee. I don't know what it was insured for, but uh, what has been um, 
the 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 roof has been paid for, which I think was about seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars, and then um, it's anticipated another million dollars. Where things have really run short is there are so many code compliance upgrades with the Fisher Community Center, and as you'll recall, like with the Coliseum and with our policy in general we only got $250,000. So anything that was above and beyond $250,000 for code compliance, we had to, to go with. And so with this building, you're talking about HVAC, electrical, fire suppression, um, just about every system is, is out of compliance at this point in creating a significant um, cost that was going to have to be borne at, at some point, but there's only 250,000 that goes towards that. Jessica, do you have, I'm sorry, you know, yeah. do, do you have any idea uh, what kind of money amount you're thinking about out of local option sales tax? I, I didn't. I really wanted to leave that discussion for, for you at this point and uh, figure out what it was that, that the council felt comfortable contributing. Your Honor. Jessica, do we have any money left in the local option sales tax? Yes. Um, I was going to say I, I, uh, I apologize for not including that most recent spreadsheet. Um, I think Diana had sent out an updated one recently. Um, but I believe that we were starting the year with a, uh, this next fiscal year with a balance of $1.5 million. It was more than a million in the... Uh, um, in, in the council designated. And uh, based on our last meeting, you did designate $284,000, I believe, of that uh, towards the South 7th Avenue extension. Um, but I believe that is the only uh, commitment that you have made since our budget process and since the budget was approved in, in late uh, March. Well, didn't we earmark money for the housing program out of there too? That was with the. So you've already subtracted that out. Yeah. In the 284 you're talking about, that's the, the sewer line on, on sixth. Uh, the 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 um, South Seventh Avenue project that we discussed at the last council right. meeting. Yeah. Yep. South Seventh Avenue. That sound that number sounds high to me for some reason. It's left at, from because we were earmarked. I, I wish Diana was here tonight because we I thought we earmarked. It's uh, hopefully she moved it out of there and earmarked it. So I thought there were several little numbers that came out of there. There are, um, and those are things that update. Like there's some outstanding grants and things. Um, so uh, yes, we. So you're you're pretty comfortable with the 1.5 million. Yeah, I can, and I can have Diana email that out to you tomorrow. Mark Eaton, 1007 South 10th Avenue. Uh, this is going to sound kind of harsh, and I don't mean it to, but maybe the board's not such a good steward of this asset because we do code upgrades. We pass electrical code every year, fire code, uh, all, all housing code, all of this. And so why do we have a limit on code upgrade insurance on anything? That seems not fiscally responsible uh, I'm involved in renovating and fixing several houses due to insurance and those people are getting new electrical, new, you know, it doesn't end. Sorry for the insurance companies, but it doesn't. So well, I don't know why this is ending, why, why we're limited. kind of staff direction do you recommend um uh that that you would provide some sort of contribution that um there is a timeliness to this that the application is due on july 15th and so the next time when you would have you have two meetings to basically provide the documentation that they need which is june 28th or july 12th um, I think for their purposes and putting together an application, they would like to know that is due on the 15th. They would like to know before the 12th as to uh, what money is allocated um, or pledged by the city for this grant.
And I, I did just find the most recent spreadsheet or the spreadsheet we used with um, Diana. It was uh, the projected fund balance ending on 630 of 22. So at the end of next fiscal year was 1.6 million. As I mentioned, that doesn't include the $284,000 that was designated previously. And I believe those are the only things that have been designated um, since the budget passed on March 23rd. So that's one year out. That's the projected number for a year from now. Correct. Will our grant writers have any feel for what amount uh, will put us in the in the mix? I I can't really say that there's anything that I found in looking. Uh, you can't see other applications. Um, you can just see that. Uh, to 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 think that we will get 20 percent is i mean they've in their own um, instructions they've said that that's not really likely um they go on to say that even a full request um fulfillment is not very likely either and so i think it's just uh what what does the council want to contribute towards this project in in general your honor Mr. So Jessica, if, the, if they don't get the grant, we don't lose the money, or we don't spend the, excuse me, bad word, bad word, we don't spend the money. I, I would say we could write the resolution um, committing the funds that it is contingent upon the award of the, the CAT grant, mm -hmm. yeah. If we don't get the CAT, CAT grant, we're likely to be approached about uh, contributing in the future <coughs> anyway to try to get that building back up to shape. Anyone wish to um, make a motion at any specific amount? I got one question here. You bet. I'm sitting here reading this, and it says, oh, you just Oops, took it away. I'm sorry. Uh, it says it requires cash contributions from the city and the county. Correct. So if we sit here and say something, and the county says no, does that void it? Correct. If the county were not to provide a contribution, then the Fisher Governor Foundation cannot apply. Because I would be interested in what the county does, since they haven't really helped us out on a, on a trail or recent history. So I would be interested in what they do before I commit to, to doing anything. That's my feeling. Do we meet again before the deadline? So if they meet with the county, do we, I mean, we, we, what's the timetable? You said it's pretty tight. Yes, so it's, uh, the application is due on July 15th. We meet again on June 28th and July 12th. Okay. So if, if we follow Councilman's hoop direction to let the county go first, all it is is for them to plug in a dollar figure from us if we so choose. It, yeah, I mean, it, that would be the, the thing we'd ha we would ultimately still have to provide them a, a resolution with that documentation of, of that dollar amount. So it wouldn't really slow down the writing the application. It, it potentially could if the county says, well, I want to see what the city's going to do. So. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess I'm. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm just, I guess I'm more inclined to lead the way with this, just as we have with the trails and other projects that... We did it with the um, Biohome and Marshalltown project recently at, at $250,000. Yeah, and I don't know what's too much and what's too little. Um, we already, you know, have the levy um, that we're going to continue giving. Um assigning, I guess, taxpayer dollars there, so. I, I guess, I think of it as a treasure here in the center of Marshalltown, and it's, um, I think it's important, an important community center, it truly is, and can be even better um, than ever. The plans are really, really cool. I know you all have seen them. And um, so I, I do recommend that we go ahead and put a number out there. And if you want my number, 
Are you waiting for my number? Um, I, I think it should be a good gift. I do a good contribution, and hopefully the CAT grant will be um, possible then. So I think I would like to say 250000 and then you guys just go from there. Tell me why not. Your Honor. Ms. Martin. I'd like to weigh in a little bit. I've done some research, um, more so with the Fisher Foundation and so on. This project is slated and is well-reasoned and well-researched and mapped out. However, it takes these steps to get to where we want to go. The investment of and renovation of the building and the grounds is going to be a total of around $10 million. $10 million for a jewel of the city that provides so much um, entertainment, uh, aid, since United Way would be in there, um, amongst others. Uh, the, the theater would be in the second phase. That's an important thing. I concur with Bethany. I was going to say 300,000, but I'll, I'll, the 250 sounds reasonable. And I know that comes from, from uh, lost funds. And I think it's very relevant that we take the lead as a city. It's going to be called the Marshalltown um, Arts and Cultural Center, MAC. Um, it really is a hub for a lot of, of city activity and uh, service. So that's where I'm weighing in. Thank you. Other discussion? I remember when we moved to town, the senior partner in the firm was Rex Ryden, and he had just taken on the assignment of raising about two to three million dollars to make the building compliant at that time, and that was before the ADA actually, but but it uh, needed a big code upgrade back then, and the city, uh, the people in the city and the foundations did contribute to that, and they met the goal and fixed it up, but that was a long time ago. And if anybody served on nonprofit boards, whether it's the United Way or uh, a host of other ones, uh, it's been a pretty common place to have the meetings held. And as, as we've seen the plans, it looks like there will be even more opportunities for those things happening with the advantage of having the Coliseum here now that will hold a thousand people when we have a really big meeting for people. I, sh I should quit talking and ask if anybody else likes to speak other than that. Uh, I'll consider this was a motion and second for the 250,000. Any other discussion up here? Let's call the roll. Thompson? No. Weirin? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? No. Lottie Hoff? Yes. Martin? Yes. I said we had a full house and I, <laughs> I was missing Gay Bison tonight. Sorry. You just noticed that? I did. <laughs> he was unusually quiet tonight. <laughs> we will bring back a resolution uh, formalizing mm -hmm. that to the next council meeting, the June 28th council meeting. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's switch gears to uh, discussion of South 7th Avenue infrastructure. Yes, I'm not sure if Ryan uh, Hugerich is on the line or not, but I figured I'd let him get everything started off um, as his re this is his request. Uh, good evening, all this way. Um, I'm the developer for the uh, JDS Apartments. Um, I'm here tonight to ask the city to hear our comments or our wishes for delaying the street extension off of 7th Ave. Um, as of right now, we're struggling to make our finances work with the added expense um, the city's requiring us at this point to pick up, which I think is around 300 and 
twenty thousand dollars um, was our portion would be our portion of the street project. Um, what we're trying to do is just get an entrance off of the Seventh Avenue cul-de-sac at this point and be able to get into our development um, into our parking lot and push the street extension project to a future date we can we're, we're open to um, piecing off a portion of that ground for a future road leaving it open and empty and, and available um, like I said we're just we're trying to make our finances work here and we're really struggling um, second part of that is I'm asking uh, if the city's open to potential uh, a better tax abatement schedule um, and the current project in another city for the same company we've gotten 20 year tax abatement um, I know that's a, a struggle for Marshalltown to hit and they've never done it before and they haven't uh, they're not doing it currently but this is kind of a special project we're, we're bringing a lot of great housing and we're hoping to bring in a lot of great people to come work at JBS and hopefully become future citizens of Marshalltown to stay there permanently. Um, this is a great marketing tool for them, and I think it's a great project. We're just we're just trying to make the numbers work, and currently they do not. And I'm I'm here for any questions or comments. Um, I'd love to hear any any feedback from from you folks. I'll throw it open to the council to give that feedback. I think the popular phrase is crickets. Well, Your Honor. Yes. Ryan, this is uh, Gary Thompson on the council. Um, so if... I want to make sure that, that I'm clear on this. So if we press for that 7th Avenue extension, you're telling me this project is dead at on, on this particular site? So if, if we're pushed to, uh, to install the street, um, it definitely will delay the project if not if not put it on hold until we find a more suitable lot that we can we can afford uh, the price for the lot is not a question right now it's it's all the expenses thereafter the city is asking us to pick up um, and the, t the tax abatement is just another piece of this um, you know if we get a better tax abatement deal maybe we could do we could afford more to pay uh, we could, we could more easily afford our portion of the street. Uh, we're just getting hit from both sides with two different expenses that we didn't calculate in our original budget. And we, we absorbed some hits along the way on the budget, but if you're talking 320 in the street, uh, the tax abatement wasn't where we had planned. We had, we had budgeted a zero tax in our, in our initial plan. Um, so that could, I haven't got a definitive number of what our tax tax liability will be. I'm going to guess it's around the hundred thousand dollar mark. So that's another annual payment we didn't we didn't forecast. And unfortunately for us to make the numbers work, we would have to pass that expense along to our customers, which entail makes it more difficult for JBS because they're marketing this as we need you here. Here's a piece we can add for you. It's a great home. It's ready to go. Um, come be a part of, of Marshalltown. Be a part of JBS. Um, we, we start raising the rents. Now we can't differentiate ourselves from, from anyone else, um, any other city. Or, or It's harder for JBS to give them those jobs. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Anyone else? I, Your Honor. Go ahead. Uh, Jessica, are, are we asking anything more from this developer than anyone else? 
Um, in our agreement. We are not. So I did put the draft of the development agreement, which uh, Roger had provided. And this is the basically the same format that was provided for two other projects um, being Cating properties with Washington Street and completing that connection of Washington Street, requiring the developer to play for, pay for the plans and designs. So basically getting us the, the engineered documents for us to put out to bid, um, installing the water and then um, construction oversight. And this is the same that uh, was recently done at the March 23rd meeting uh, for prime development um, for the uh, cul-de-sac for the Creekside Estates development off of 6th Street. Because I'm not at all comfortable with a 20 year tax abatement. That's off the table for me. If uh, nobody else from the council wishes <coughs> to comment, we can open the microphones and phones. The lines are unmuted. Thank you. Uh, Mark Eaton, 1007 South 10th Avenue. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, we paid 700 some thousand dollars for Washington Street extension for the Cating development, and we didn't require city streets in within their development. The Cating property by Hospice House, there was a city street in that development agreement, but as far as I know, you guys are going to have to release them out of that since now that city street can't go through. Um, so we are bending for other developers. The mayor says consistently we need more housing. We've got this study. We need more housing. We need more housing. So there's no way that we can make this work with them because, I mean, if we give them 700000 for the road, I don't know what I heard him say. Something like they need to pay 300000 for this road. I don't know what, what he said, but I'm just asking for clarification on that. Yeah, to, to just go back and, and clarify from where we were in discussion at our last meeting, um, <laughs> working uh, CGA has been hired by um, HCI, Ryan, and basically we had initially talked about a fairly large street that was like a $1.5 million project um, and uh, was basically running down the property, uh, the eastern or western property line. Council Member Thompson had brought up at that meeting in early May on uh, that uh, did that really make sense given that, you know, it's a street, you want development on both sides of the street. Um, that's when Heather from CGA came back to us in the meantime and presented the uh, current concept, which I will pull up here on the screen. that uh, doesn't have the street basically running down the, the uh, property line and just being developable on one side, but has really this um, smaller segment that still leaves South 7th Avenue to be developed. Um, to go back of why is South 7th Avenue important? It is important because it is in our uh, 2030 comp plan as a minor collector street uh, with ultimately the ability to connect down to South Ridge um, for future development. And so as we looked at this revised concept that, uh, um, that CGA had proposed, we felt that this was a great way to, um, you know, still provide development opportunities uh, to happen on a South 7th Avenue that would eventually make its way towards um, South, towards Southridge and still provide the, the public access and not the dead end here. And so uh, the, one of the goals of the uh, comprehensive plan was to look for these, these connections and to not make dead ends. And so that's ultimately why this is before you. Um, so, oops, um, so as we talked about the partnership, as we mentioned here in the, the, the last um, uh, conversation about local option sales tax, um, the developer uh, is being asked to do the same things that we've requested of other developers in this agreement, which is to pay for the um, plans and steps and to uh, pay, pay for the water installation and then for construction oversight. The city picks up the rest of the tab, which I think was around $820,000. And so you provided direction 
to put together a development agreement that had those costs coming from storm sewer funds for the portion that was for storm sewer, sanitary sewer for the portion that was from sanitary sewer, um, using the $236,000 special road use tax payment, and then at least pledging um, the uh, remainder, which was that 284,000 from local option sales tax. And so um, that was presented to Ryan uh, by email on May 27th. And uh, this past week, um, he asked that this be on the agenda for a rediscussion and to bring forward the proposal to not construct what is on the map before you right now, um, to not have the city construct what is on the map before you right now. You're on. The goal here, can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. And the goal here is I'm not only trying to save my own budget, I'm also trying to say uh, I don't see any any value out of the city putting in a street to nowhere, spending, uh, I believe Jessica said, your portion would be 800 and some thousand dollars. Um, I have no idea when that street would ever connect to the east, if it ever will. Um, it's, un it's undeveloped farm ground now. It could be next month. It could be 50 years from now. Um, this... The whole goal of this, of this project is we found a great piece of ground. Putting 108 units in Marshalltown in one site is very difficult. I've looked at multiple, multiple sites. Um, there's been different strings attached that I couldn't make them work. And uh, like I said, if, if, if this lot doesn't work because the street doesn't fit in our budget and we have to walk away from it, um, so be it. Just to know that this this project will grow. Uh, I don't see a stopping at 108 units. I think we could be over 300 units over the next five years. But we have to have a starting ground. Um, we, we take all of our proceeds of what we what we make in this project and put them into the next one, two, and three phases of this same idea, the same concept. So anything the city can do to help us get the... We, we have to start somewhere, right? Um, we just don't have the funds available. We can't raise the rates to a point that it doesn't make sense. If the city can't help us here, we may, uh, like I said, we may just have to hold off for a better time. I'm also getting hit with all of my building materials have gone through the roof. We've absorbed those costs and we're still trying to move forward. Um, I'm just, I'm here, I'm here asking uh, anything we can do. We can meet in the middle somewhere. Anything you do to help our project become successful would be, it would be great. One, one clarification to make what Ryan said. Uh, at this point, they can only fit 103 units on that current site, and we'll need a secondary roadway, um, secondary access other than South 7th Avenue um, going towards Olive Street in order to construct more than 103 units. Your Honor. Yes. Um, this is another one of Gary's stupid questions. We just recently <laughs> rezoned this, correct? Correct. So what what is stopping them from just making their driveway come off 7th Avenue stub and building 103 units? What's what's stopping you is what staff brought forward to you that our comprehensive plan does not identify that as a dead end. I, I understand that. But the comprehensive plan has been um, evolved over time. And has their, our comprehensive plan is not set in stone, correct? Correct. Um, we, have, we have built and, and changed things over the years. Certainly. So I'm saying if legally can, can we stop them from building 103 units and using 7th Avenue running right into their driveway? I, I would say, I'll, I'll go to that a question, then I'll have Michelle talk about the plan. So what is before you and what your direction has been to staff since May 24th is that we proceed with the development agreement for this construction of the street. You can provide <coughs> different direction tonight, if you would so choose, to direct staff that the development of the street is not necessary, but they still have codes to comply with. Um, you can't just build a, off the, the end of the stub there. You have to basically dead end it for fire um, access purposes. And so that would then go back to our development review process where we would go through basically what, what codes would uh, 
guide us through the development without sort of in a through street um, that would basically be through the property um, versus providing a fire access um, turnaround um, at the end of South 7th Avenue and the, the public utilities that would still need to be extended to their property. So that leads me right in, thank you, that leads me right into my next question for Michelle. When you sat down for the very first preliminary meetings, you showed them the other diagram that we wanted 7th Avenue to go to the south if they were interested in this property. Yes, yeah, so we've, had, we've had lots of conversations about properties. And I, I want to first go back to the comprehensive plan briefly. Um, so the comprehensive plan is, is what I would consider a, a living document, and it is something that can be amended and changed. Um, should uh, the desire be to move away from this type of connection and through street i believe that that's something that would need to be amended by the comprehensive plan through the plan zoning commission and then through the city council um, connectivity transportation network is essential to our development and i believe strongly that this is a piece of that connectivity that we want to maintain um, i believe that the planning commission would feel very strongly um, in the same faction that they want to have this connection. So to make that change and move away from trying to ensure that these type of connections happen when development is occurring should be something that goes back through that process to amend a comprehensive plan just as we do, just as we did on this particular lot when we amended it, when we rezoned it. Um, so that is a process that can happen, um, but should go through um, those that commission in the council um, with regards to this lot when it was first brought to our attention we talked about many different things and challenges with this property um, access being a primary point of conversation uh, limiting with the limit of number of units based on secondary access points through traffic uh, floodplains there was a number of things that were talked about with this property ultimately it's a owner's decision whether or not they want to pursue a project at a certain area based on all those expenses that they have to take into consideration um, that's not up to us to decide and weigh all those things but we try to bring forward all of the information that we can about a property um, as we look at many sites with many developers we do that same process um, and so try to present as much information as we can that we're aware of as projects develop more information often becomes available and brought forward because situations change, layouts change, things like that happen. So what we may not envision in a very first conversation sometimes develops as we talk. So Michelle, even, even this change from the original one, you're saying would still need to go back through planning and zoning? Uh, it, it does not necessarily need to go to the Plan Zoning Commission. Um, as Jessica referenced, the development process, we have a development review process that happens okay. on a staff administrative level. Oh, okay. And that's the part that we're still finalizing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then one more comment. I would be remiss, and he would be upset with me, but um, since Gabe could not be here tonight, um, I don't want to speak for him, but he has stated to me that um, – if this street doesn't go in, he's against the project moving forward. That's his position. So I think I quoted him accurately in that. So thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Anyone else wish to weigh in? Well, let me recommend that we uh, mull this over and we can, uh, if one of the counselors requests, have it back on the discussion for the next meeting. Yeah, I, I think then how we would proceed is that your direction from May 24th would still be the direction that staff would be taking unless you would provide different direction tonight. Well, I can, I can go on record and tell you I don't agree with a 20-year tax abatement or TIF or anything else if you need direction on that part of it I, I so my my convert 
Go ahead, Brian. The tax abatement piece is a very easy tool for the city to offer to help this project become successful. It doesn't, you weren't, you're collecting maybe, maybe a $500 a year on that lot currently. Uh, if 20 year doesn't fit in your, in your schedule, uh, you know, I'm open to suggestion. Um, and like I said, anything we do to help fitting up, finding, finding anywhere else in Marshalltown to fit this many units has been, like I said, difficult. This is one of the few lots it will work. We're just adding more expense to an unnecessary problem, uh, in my opinion, at this point. Uh, I'm not saying this road isn't going to be useful down the road. It just doesn't fit into our budget currently. Uh, has nothing to do. I'm not going against the city plan or their dreams. Uh, it's sheer dollars and cents for us, and we're, we, we hold a pretty tight budget. We're a very conservative company, and uh, we're just looking for some guidance here. Thank you. Jessica, does this qualify? F does multifamily housing qualify for the automatic three-year tax abatement? So I included this in the packet as well because my communications all along um, with Ryan have been we have an existing abatement schedule for residential, which does include multifamily residential, um, which has been available to um, the other uh, the other uh, Kading Properties development as well. And so there's the three-year 100% schedule, there's a five-year sliding schedule, and then a 10-year schedule. And so we do have multifamily properties that have taken advantage of, of that and not asked for any other incentives. Right. Thank you. I missed that in the packet. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. I, I don't see anybody else approaching the mic or um, checking in on the phone. And uh, not hearing a motion to uh, proceed differently, let's uh, go on to the next item then. And that would be the... Um, Hmm. Yes. I just lost my place on the agenda here. Your Honor, would you be opposed to a five-minute recess? No. A five-minute recess makes sense after I will second this, that. Uh, this number of uh, hours. Let's, let's call a recess. Thank you. I got to apologize because I think I was gone.
500 bucks a month. Let's go ahead and try to get back to our seats here. And they're going to sell it in about 10 years. See, and that's the problem it is, is there, see, his overhead cost went up. Mm -hmm. And so he said, Jesus, if I'm going to make any money, i got to get the city to do more. And, and, and I'm sure that's where he is. I mean, he was all in agreement on Okay, we are uh, back out of recess. I don't think we need a motion for that. And we should be at the next item of discussion number four, which was changes in fee schedules, mm -hmm. starting with the fire department fee schedule. I see the chief approaching the microphone. Good evening, Dave Ryerson, Marshtown Fire Department. So in your packet, you have a list of proposed fee changes. Um, as I went back and looked, the, fee, the permit fee schedule has not changed um, other than the addition of a couple fees since at least 2008. And I would be willing to bet that it goes even further. Um, in 2008 is when the 2006 International Fire Code was adopted. So what I would like to recommend to you uh, in the 2015 edition that you, that you uh, enacted last year, it stipulates what operational permits should, or what uh, operations should be permitted, but it does not list a fee schedule. It says it's up to the jurisdiction to establish what fees that they charge for the permits. So what I would like to recommend is that we increase all of our permit fees, our operational permit fees by $5. I would recommend that we institute, and I believe it was in your packet as well, institute the 2021 Iowa Fire Service Hazmat Response Fee Schedule. I believe that should have been attached with the, the permits. Uh, increase our plan review fees for architectural sprinkler system and alarm systems by $25 each. Uh, and increase legal burn fees by $10. Then um, additionally, what I would like to uh, give to you for discussion topics is uh, a standby fee for natural gas leaks that where we stand by for more than an hour on scene. When, when I commit a crew for an hour or more, I have to call people back in to stand by at the station so I've got a full firefighting response. So this would be assessed on contractors who strike a natural gas line either during trenching or boring operations um, and then it, and if it's improperly marked or excuse me if it's properly marked and they hit it that is when i would that we would assess this fee if it's something that they hit something but it's improper it's improperly marked um, then i would not i would not in, um, i would not uh, assess the contractor and then what I did notice in just a little bit ago as I was looking at it, I put the old fee in there. So if, so if you do approve the fee schedule changes, that actually would be $312.25, which would be the new rate by the Iowa, service, Iowa Fire Service fee schedule. The other thing that I would put out there for you to consider, and I will admit it's a little bit of a controversial one, is uh, contained within property insurance, there is uh, contingencies for fire department services and depending on who you have for insurance that fee would range anywhere from 500 to 2500 dollars depending on the company so that would be an, another place that we could consider um, uh, charging a fee charging a fee for uh, and billing whatever whatever rate would be uh, determined by the council and I would be happy to answer any additional questions that you might have. Your Honor, if I can go back here, I should have introduced this and then the items to come. Um, so for the past two or three years now, we've been bringing you a resolution at our final meeting in June for you to basically set all of the fees for the next fiscal year. And so uh, this is the, the time of the year where if there's anything to be changed, uh, we want to bring that forward to you now. And then um, if there are things that you would want to change, we'd recommend a motion um, to put the updates or to put the recommended changes into the fee schedule that would come forward to you by resolution on the 28th. I have a question for Chief Ryerson. Far away. So that one you, you said was kind of controversial. Yes. What what fire department services, like any of the services you guys provide, 
even like it, medical no, assist no, or it would, okay no, it would be just it would be just strictly fire. just for fire okay okay your honor my question for chief ryerson is if these fees haven't been touched in what'd you say 2001 Eight. well at least 2008 is five dollars enough <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I tried to be. I tried to be conservative um, on those fees. Um, we got so many things going on in in city. I just thought that that was a a reasonable that was a reasonable increase. Are you having luck collecting these fees right now? Well, to a certain extent, we are. <laughs> <laughs> what What's the process if you don't? What, how does that work? Um, they get uh, they get billed by the city when we do an inspection and they pass it They get a permit issued for their operation and then that's the finance department invoices them for their for their fee and if it doesn't get paid then then they uh, You know they pay a they pay a fine and I believe we're are we not taking them for to the um, offset uh, offset collect tax property or income tax offset so there's there's differences in how the collection works but ultimately with the assembly fees we were looking at if they're not paid by the time the next inspection runs around that we can revoke their assembly fee and file a, a municipal infraction uh, against them um, for for basically being in violation of operating without a permit mm -hmm. or a license probably better than doing a controlled burn I, I was kind of with uh, Gary on that one, though, in terms of is five dollars enough? I, it will it, will it really uh, be burdensome to anybody if we want ten or fifteen? I, I somebody's going to complain. Yeah, but they're doing so. You're there because they're doing something illegal, right? So Absolutely. what's their complaint? They got caught, right? So can I suggest maybe a sliding thing for? If it's under fifty, you do the five dollars. If it's fifty to a hundred, we do ten dollars. And if it's are you are you what? So which one are you talking about, Councilman? You're talking about the illegal burning. Well, are you talking about all of them? All of them. You know, you said you went across. I'm looking at the spreadsheet, not this one, but the other one across. Mm -hmm. the, yep. Across the board, this you one. went you went five bucks, but. Yep, I went five went five dollars on permits and ten dollars on illegal burns and twenty five dollars on plan reviews. Your Honor, I suggest we go with this plan and next year do some pre work ahead of time and look at that type of sliding yeah. I'd schedule. Go with, I, I, I go with that. Yeah, I like that idea too. Bethany's so smart sometimes. <laughs> Once in a while, <laughs> I get one. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Anything else I can answer? Are we going to do these one at a time? In which case, I would take uh, uh, Bethany's uh, as a motion. I'll second yep. that. Does anybody anticipate needing to open the mics for ten seconds on this one? I don't. I, I doubt there are a whole bunch of uh, landlords out there chomping at the bit to. No. Are you talking about just the fire department or all of them? Just the fire. Just, just the fire. fire. Yeah, just the fire for this one. The mics, mics are open, and uh, we don't have many callers on the line. So, what's well, call the roll? Gowdy. Yes. Hoop. Yes. Lottie Hoff. Yes. Martin. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Warren. Yes. Very good. Thanks. On to one, the one clarification that I think uh, uh, Chief Ryerson and I would want direction on is this fire service fee, do you want us to bring this back for dis further discussion um, and maybe information, or is it just not something that you want to consider implementing at this point in time? Are you talking about number two under additional fee sources? Correct. No, I'm fine with that. Yeah. I, I, I guess I was assuming that everything I thought it was proposed just was included. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
we're, we're, I think we're, we're good. So um, we will bring back a, a proposal. We'll include in the fee schedule what that is and then work with the city clerk to highlight uh, where changes have taken place in that fee schedule. I am curious now, but others are too, which insurance companies have that in there and which don't. Yeah, so that, that might be helpful to know when it comes back to us. Well, everybody that I talked to, so that was State Farm, um, all state farmers, they all have it in there. It's just, it varies by department what that contingency amount is. Okay. Very good. Okay. I think you got our direction, got the direction. Thank you. Let's attack the police department fee schedule. Do you want to handle that? I should, sure, I can. <laughs> <laughs> you might have some expertise in that. <laughs> So Chief Tupper has recommended increasing two of the fees that they offer. Um, they do provide fingerprinting services, which they currently charge $8 per card. Uh, staff is recommending that they increase the fee to $20 for the service, regardless of the number of cards that they have. And they would also like to waive that fee for employees of the Marshtown Community School District. And for many years now, the police department has charged $45 per hour for officers that are hired to do extra duty jobs. Um, they do have a two hour minimum for that. The $45 doesn't always cover the actual cost that the city incurs for the officer's time and expenses like their uniforms, their car, their equipment. So uh, Chief Tupper is recommending to increase that to $55 per hour with a two hour minimum. Any discussion? I just have one comment, Your Honor. Go for it. Uh, owning a previous business that some of the locations offered fingerprinting service to the private sector, and his $20 ask for regardless of the number of the cards in the private world, it'd be 20 bucks a pop per card. So I would, I would recommend that, I mean, I, I, I guess this is his call. I don't know how much you know service he's getting, but and then I the the I would tack on to that that I'm okay with raising it to 55, if not more. Okay. Other discussion. I, again, I just I would rather just go with the recommendations, <laughs> <laughs> especially since Chief Tupper isn't here. But I I mean we could debate many of these fees tonight and I just don't I, they've put a lot of effort into this and I think there's some rhyme to it some reason to it it doesn't hurt to have him aware that maybe next year uh, a little sooner than this time if we're looking right. at, at uh, trying to keep up with the cost of living but your honor yes in defense of your comment though um, I think all of them are, are erring on the side of caution mm -hmm. to an extreme that they they're afraid to come forward with large fee schedules. So, but yes, I would if that's your motion, I would second that. <laughs> let's let's uh, consider that as a motion and second. Any other discussion? I guess we could unmute just just because. I, I will say I don't think it's fear. I think it's more of a just looking at nobody likes to see like 50% plus increases. And so it's trying to be realistic about things. Thoughtful. Lines are unmuted. Car Carol isn't here anymore, but the Y used to go 10 years at a time without increasing fees. And then there'd have to be a big jump. And, and finally, about 30 years ago, they decided to just every year increase it a little bit as they went and that seems that has seemed to work pretty well over the years I don't think they've lost much membership they did you lose some membership when that was a big jump okay let's call the roll Lottie Hoff yes Martin yes Thompson yes Warren yes Gowdy yes hoop yes okay now we're on to housing and community development Michelle Okay, I'll try not to disappoint you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Be bold, Michelle. Good luck. Bold. Good luck with that. <laughs> Michelle Sponheimer, wow. Housing Community Development. Um, I don't have a whole lot of uh, changes to our existing fees, but we do have a couple sign permits. We had a basic uh, minimum fee of 25. I'm recommending doubling that to 50. 
Um, and that just really covers a, about an hour's worth of time per staff time, which is, which is uh, usually spent on those. Um, planned unit developments, uh, we have seen amendments to planned unit developments happening more frequently. Um, we have a $200 fee for those um, amendments. I'm proposing a $500 fee when it requires the process that is similar to the rezoning, so the public hearing process. So when we have an increase in density, those more significant amendments um, that take more time in meetings and process, that those have an increased fee of $500 instead of the $200. So that's essentially a, a, a new, new fee for that um, more... Uh, process intensive uh, item. And then the two new ones are related to our vacant property code, which was just recently adopted. Um, so this is, uh, if you recall in the ordinance, we had the fees set by resolution. So this is the time where we're bringing those forward. Um, what we're proposing, or what I'm proposing is a, a registration fee of $100 for all properties that are required to register um, in, under that code and then a uninsured property fee of $3,000 um, for properties that have structures on them that do not have insurance as um, specified in the ordinance. So a property can have insurance at those minimum coverage, provide a bond as an option. If they are unable or unwilling to do those items then they would have an increased fee um, that would be assigned for an uninsured property. Uh, primary uh, purpose in that is certainly if we get uh, stuck as we have with demolition costs, um, should something happen to a property, um, we are certainly going to expend way more than $3,000 um, on that. And uh, so this would be an effort to try to encourage people to have insurance um, or maintain, uh, take care of those properties um, that might become a burden for us down the road. I'm afraid we've learned 3,000 doesn't even touch it. It doesn't touch it. <laughs> Would anybody like to uh, move to approve that fee schedule? Well, I have a question first, Your Honor. Go of course it. I do. So, Michelle, the $100, is that annual? Yeah, uh, it annual. says annual. Yes, okay. annual. And then your $3,000, um, the only problem I have with this is we can't force occupied buildings to have insurance. Okay. So they're around to get around this is they put an office in their vacant building and go there once a week and walk through and they come back to you and tell you they're occupied. Mm -hmm. So how are you, I guess I'm just looking at how you can enforce that. I, you know, I think with, with those things, obviously we're going to run into issues where people, you know, will try to circumvent, but if they're occupying it once a week, then they're occupying it okay. too. So right. it's, it's no longer a vacant unoccupied building. So um, if they're willing to go to that, length um well, this is what i meant with there's several yeah. loopholes and you know the biggest one is they just yeah. put their building on the market and it get, buys them a whole year mm -hmm. they're yeah. totally exempt on this whole thing yeah. or they sell it to somebody in humboldt for a buck yep and then they hold it for a year and <laughs> put it on the market and sell it to somebody else it just they they're exempt from everything that's where those are the loopholes there's we need to clean up but well and i think as we as we work through this ordinance in that first year i think we'll be able to refine those and figure out where amendments will be needed but i'm happy with your increases okay. compared to <laughs> chief tuppers and chief ryerson <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah, yeah. Do, we, do we need a i, I, I don't think we've we, had a motion second have we okay i move that we accept the fees i'll second Okay. And the lines are <laughs> unmuted. Let's see if anybody wants to talk in the next five seconds quickly. No. Let's vote. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Lottiehoff? Yes. Martin? Yes. Very good. Now on to public works fee schedule. Justin? I'm going to start with a big one as an attempt not to disappoint Councillor Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't know if any of the councils were, but we allow access to our compost facility during the off season, which is really a very convenient thing for the tree contractors in this town. So my very first recommendation is an addition of a fee access fee of $500 a year to access our compost facility during the winter months. We've been uh, running on the honor system for the whole time that I've been here, and I'm going to guess we lose at least $500 a 
a year in what we're actually being uh, told for what's being dumped down there during the off season. I don't see anybody shaking their head, so I'm gonna I'm gonna progress to my next uh, <laughs> event or uh, the special event trailer. Uh, if anyone remembers, we went through the lean process, I believe, in 20 or 19. Time flies, uh, and the city has purchased a special event trailer, which is uh, available to the uh, public for use at a uh, local public block party. Um, the trailer has barricades, uh, trash cans, cones, uh, the kind of things that uh, a neighborhood would need to be able to block off the street for the use during a uh, party. Um, we have two levels. A special event trailer could be delivered by the Public Works Department, set up and pick up for $300, or it could just be delivery and pick up for $150. So those three, the access to the compost facility and the two special event trailers are addition to our current fee schedule. Uh, and then as I move down, we have changes, um, mostly, uh, well, I should say in two areas in the compost and our electrical department. Um, I can run through each one real quickly. Um, again, probably uh, disappointing Councilor Thompson. These are modest increases. <laughs> Loading fee, 15 to $20. Sale of compost, a large truck, large dump truck, 100 to 175. Pickup truck, 35 to 40. Uh, small dump truck, 70 to 85. And then the sale of wood chips, large dump truck, 75 to 80. Uh, pickup, 25 to 30. Dump truck, 30 to 40. Uh, yard waste disposal, um, trailer, a small trailer, four by six, six to $10. One ton pickup, 14 to 25, uh, half ton to a three quarter ton, nine to 15. Small pickup, six to 10, large truck, 28 to 40. Huh. One ton pickup, 14 to 25. Uh, dump truck, 39 to 50. Disposal packer truck, 55 to 90, or a small dump truck to 28 to 30. Uh, the one thing I should say as we're, we're live is uh, you'll notice we're trying to avoid the fees to the average user that's bringing in one or two bags. We are making no changes to the, to the price of a bag. We are trying to change the prices for our larger users, uh, tree contractors, people that are actually bringing in larger volumes. Uh, and then on to changes in the electrical department, uh, contractor license, 750 uh, oh, I had an extra zero in there, $75 to $100. Exam fee, 25 to 30. Uh, expedited exam, 150 to 200. Apprentice license, 100 to tw or 10 to 20. Electrical permit, basic fee, 15 to $25. Generator, 21 kilowatt or greater, uh, one, $1 to $10. Journeyman electric license, 20 to 30. Lighting or power service for one meter, 10 to 15. Lighting or power service for each additional meter, five to 10. Uh, and then the increase of a maximum fee from 500 to 1,000. And then the very last uh, subsection I have is on removal. And I can see I have an error in there. But anyway, uh, wastewater discharge applicant fee and wastewater discharger permit were duplicate. We actually have those on another line item in our fee schedule. And then it shouldn't be a removal, but uh, personnel charges at the water pollution control plant. They had a schedule for uh, the secretary, the, uh, the director of the water pollution control plant at what they were charging per hour for their fees. Uh, I don't know how long it had been since it had been updated. So I'm just uh, simply suggesting we update to the 2021 hourly rates for those positions. Are there any questions or uh, groveling that I can do for disappointing? <laughs> I've got a question. Go for it. Overall, and I know these are individual fee changes and so on. Justin, would you say how how long has it been since we had any substantial changes? Um, to compost, we made some changes last year. Again, kind of following what we were talking about, we're trying to make them modest, small in uh, small changes. Um, we mentioned the addition of the new ones, uh, the electrical fees i don't know i'd have to ask i'm going to guess that we haven't changed them since i've been here and i just celebrated my seventh anniversary so uh, again you know being modest and not increasing every year okay anybody else any motion to approve it so moved second let's just call the vote Hoop. yes Lottie Hoff? Yes. Martin? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. If there was an electrician out there and you wanted to speak, speak up now. <laughs> okay, good. 
let's go on to the next one, and that's the housing and, oops, no, rental inspection program. I'm sorry. So switching gears from fees, uh, just to be clear. Um, so as the, um, as you recall, when we went through strategic planning session, we had some conversation about our rental inspections program. Um, at the end of this year uh, coming up, I will, I have an anticipated retirement within uh, my division. And uh, we figured that this is an opportunity for us to evaluate the program. Um, and uh, how we've been operating um, and look at some potential um, modifications to that. And so as, as I mentioned, we did talk about this uh, during strategic planning session. Um, I'm now bringing forward a, a more refined proposal and with additional information and some details of the route that we'd like to um, pursue. Um, and that this process and kind of getting us to that point would be in anticipation of making changes effective January 1st, uh, 2022. So essentially after retirement. Um, so I'm not gonna uh, go through each of the bullets that I have included in the proposal, but I just wanna highlight a couple of them um, and answer any questions that you have. One of the primary things that I would be proposing is that we look at the code itself. This has often been an item of discussion. Um, certainly we have varying opinions, interpretations, and things of that nature. Um, we have adopted uh, throughout the city the international um, code series for several of our departments. There is an international property maintenance code, which um, is often used for rental housing standards. I propose that we would be looking at that code um, to, to match with some of our other uh, code series that we've adopted. Um, certainly we'll have some amendments and modifications that we would want to make out of that, which is pretty typical whenever we adopt a code by reference, um, that we have items that we maybe exclude or amend um, to fit with our locale and, and some of the things that we um, have continued to uh, maintain or, or want to see uh, in those standards. Um, I suspect that that process uh, would take us several months. We certainly want to have some uh, public engagement opportunities with our property owners um, as we make a big change like that. Um, so I'm recommending that we would uh, come up with uh, the draft language um, over the next month and a half, and then in August kind of present it more to the property owners and public for some feedback and comments with a, a adoption um, by the end of October um, on that code. Um, the the second big item really that i want to um, present would be how we conduct our inspections obviously with the retirement um, my proposal with this would be to look at contracted services for the um, primary inspections the reoccurring inspections um, that would happen we would maintain um, our one full-time inspector um, to handle complaint items uh, new units coming online uh, we also have to maintain our HUD inspections um, with our Section 8 program and then to fill in as needed um, in times when we may have uh, a large number that are occurring or something of that nature. Um, this would uh, allow us to still have some of that in-house control of things that are happening, um, addressing any uh, complications that may come up, but it also does give us an outlet to utilize a, a contracted service to help um, with those inspections and getting those completed on a, a timely, a timely fashion, um, and having a, a identified, identified standard of what they're inspecting for based on that adoption of the code. Um, we would be also um, reviewing what fees um, would, how fees would be structured based on that. Um, and uh, looking at still maintaining a registration process um, for per unit fee. Right now we have a tiered structure based on the number of units on your parcel. We'd look at just a flat per unit um, fee uh, to cover those expenses that we're still maintaining in house. The contracted inspection service fees would be billed, um, the city would pay those initially and then bill the property owner is what I'd propose. That way we don't have the concern of is that contracted inspector actually working for the landlord and potentially having some type of, um, you know, things that aren't aren't being inspected as they should be according to our code. We wanna make sure we don't uh, create that situation. Um, 
the other thing that I would be recommending is that we think about the inspection frequency. One of the common items that we do hear about in terms of uh, complaints, whether it be from residents or property owners, um, is problem properties that are allowed to uh, uh, continue in a situation and not be inspected as frequently. They deteriorate, become problems. They end up with a lot of complaints. Um, my proposal would be is that properties that have, um, and this would be something to be determined, but some type of level of fail items or seriousness of their uh, delinquencies would be inspected more frequently than properties that are in compliance and have minimal fail items at their routine. So it could be that if you have a property where things are very well maintained, you have a couple of items that come up or which are kind of regular maintenance items that's not uncommon you know, you move to every five years get inspected, um, as opposed to if you have severe um, uh, deficiencies on an ongoing basis, you maybe move down to every year inspection. Um, again, that would push um, those costs associated with those inspections to the owner. Um, it gives them <coughs> the opportunity to do pre-inspection, stay on top of things so that they don't have to be in that kind of um, situation where they're subject to higher frequency of inspections. So I think that that would address some of our concerns um, as a community that we hear um, with problem properties um, being on a more regular rotation. So as I said, there's a number of things that I did put in here that I don't uh, feel are necessarily that different from what we're doing, but I just wanted to highlight them. I'm willing to answer any questions that you have about this. Um, my hope would be that tonight um, you're able to just give some direction if this is a process that you want to continue for me to pursue that will start down that path with the intention of having everything finalized um, to go effective the first of the calendar year. Questions or comments? Uh, I appreciate the thought you've put into it and plans. I think it sounds good. Good changes. Thank you. Can I count that as a motion to approve? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Your Honor. Mr. Thompson. Michelle, the only, the only one I have issue with is outsourcing the inspections. I just, you know, you said it yourself, identified standard, a difference of identified standard. Um, and you also use the term in-house control. I just, I want both of them to work for you, under you, so we have in-house control and that identified standard and just, some of the things you've alluded to, the public is going to allude to those too. That, yeah. you know, oh, get get the private contractor, wink, wink. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I just don't want to open that door. I don't think we've come so far, and we're moving forward. I I just I'm just hesitant on that. That everything else I'm fine with. I'm just hesitant on that one, and I don't. And I think we why why do you want to move that way? I guess is my question. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, and, and, and I, I'll be real honest, I go back and forth with it myself. And, I, and my, my thought is, is that we, we start through this process and we do have some of that engagement and some of the code discussion. Um, I'm, I'm still leaving that window open that there may be, there may be thought of we are able to do in-house. Certainly hiring um, is always something that is a concern. Um, and being able to hire somebody, you've got to train them and bring them on board. Um, and that, that takes time, um, resources. Um, and so the idea of uh, being able to step in with a, a contracted firm that can immediately step in with that knowledge base and uh, um, ability to take on those things. Um, the past few years have been very hard, right, with all of our disasters. And um, we know that we have units that aren't on schedule um, and getting completed as they need to be. Um, so a hope would be is that we'd be able to move things on track um, as well and get uh, some of these inspections back in line. Um, so there's there's multiple pieces there. Um, I don't know that this is 100% the best option. Um, there are definitely advantages to in-house uh, staffing as well as contracted. So um, this was my attempt to try to get the best of both worlds, if you, if you will, um, where we would have the ability with contracting to step up services when we need them. Um, you know, they'll have the ability if they have additional inspectors, it's not just one potential inspector, right? If you have a contracted firm that has multiple people, they can get us uh, on track with some of those things, address 
high levels when needed, um, as well as still maintaining the opportunity for um, the in-house to be able to go back and check and make sure that things are still as we are wanting and moving forward where we haven't lost lost all of it. So. Is there a firm in town that would, that offers those services right now, or are we talking about hiring somebody out of town and sending taxpayers money out of town? There are um, there there are multiple firms that do inspection services. Um, I don't know if we have any specifically locally, um, and so that is something that we would be looking at. I do know that there are firms um, within the state and region that that offer that service, but we would put it out for a bid process um, to to hear from inspectors. Um, that think that they could fulfill that. Yeah. I guess at this stage, I'm, I'm, a, I'm for everything else you proposed except that one caveat there. I just, I just don't like opening the door to outsourcing. I know it's happened to public works years ago. You know, we don't have the, the personnel and the equipment we used to own. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reiterate, you know, where do we stop outsourcing then? You know, I mean, so, so the quick answer to that is when we have a general fund budget where our revenues can meet expenditures, the, the reality is that outsourcing, especially when you have your landlords paying the direct fee that is being charged, yeah, means yeah. that we have the salary savings of one individual, which is not easy to do in government. And I think that, uh, you know, as we talk about budgets, you know, in the past and in the future, where no one wants to cut positions. And so waiting for the time when retirements are taking place to make some big changes is something that we're able to do. And we would, we would be at a deficit to not propose that to you, that we make some significant changes when we have that ability versus coming to you and proposing that you lay off somebody in a newly filled but, position. But understand my position, who you're talking to from previously tonight. I tried to pull $68,000 back into the general fund now, which would have paid most of the salary and some of the benefits and it was voted down and, and now you're talking about outsourcing you know what i mean we, we're losing an employee because of the general fund deficit deficit is what you're arguing for and sixty-eight thousand so, wouldn't have solved anything uh, and so we would still be doing the same thing even if the chamber agreement was different than what was approved tonight i mean that's the reality of as we're looking at things there are tough choices coming up ahead not just in this next year but years and years after and we need to right size our organization and the staffing that we have in order to be able to stay within the revenue constraints that we really have so a housing inspection base pay is more than sixty-eight thousand dollars, not including benefits. I don't think it is. I think Probably not starting. Yeah, I yeah. was going to say not at a starting level. Okay. Wow. And and I will just say this will not be the the end of the proposals that we bring back to you inside and outside of the budget process to change our operations because we can't keep doing the same thing and I understand how that argument is contrary to the the chamber agreement tonight and I put that in my memo at the last meeting we can't continue to do the same thing with the chamber as well in future years when we start to see those impacts of, right then who of else can we let, let's let's open the conversation who else can we outsource yeah, you'll you'll have proposals as we know of retirements and things coming so we back. just we just need department heads and we outsource every service that the city offers that's that's not what we're looking at but as we have retirements we're always looking at what positions are really necessary to continue operations and can we operate in a different way provide actually a higher level of service potentially by getting more of those inspections done than two staff members and two disasters have been able to do and so we we do believe that this will be a, a, a higher level of service in terms of completing those things you know I, I go back to what you and other council members have often stated about wanting to make sure that our community is a a safe um, community that provides housing that is you know not something that we're getting complaints on not something that you guys are complaining to our code enforcement inspector on this is how you do it by making sure that we get all of those inspections completed and basically moving that forward to the point where there's eyes on properties where they need to be on a more off, uh, more continuous basis. Does it matter if there are employees' eyes or a contractor's eyes? I don't think so. I think it's the end goal of making sure that those properties are inspected. And we can't just do that with two employees. I think you'd be looking at how many employees do you really need to complete the workload that we have if we're not talking about outsourcing. And I think that number is greater than two. Okay, well, we're gonna agree to disagree because I think it matters. 
that we have city employees doing this work. Um, I look at it from a taxpayer that, you know, I'm, I'm losing an employee that lives in the city, that pays taxes, is part of the community, and now more than likely we're going to outsource this to an out-of-town business that's going to take this money. I just, I don't see this as a win for us right now. I just, because if your argument is outsourcing is more economically sound, then let's outsource everybody, everybody we can. And, and ultimately, I would just say, we're looking at those things as we have employment changes. And that's, that's the reality of the financial situation that we're in. And so um, we would love to be able to staff all of our functions at the level that they need but we can't do that with the budget that we have. And that's the reality that uh, I've been here for nearly five years, and that's been five years for me, and I can look around at who's been here much longer, and that's been the reality for quite a long time. Yeah, I think in this, in this discussion, this is part of why I'm bringing this forward. If there is a sentiment of the council that, you know, this isn't the route that we wanna go as a whole, then that's where I'm needing to know and look for that direction um, this is a proposal that you know i'm bringing forward based on those conversations that we've had and looking at the overall um, but certainly if if council you know feels differently about that this is the this is the time to provide that direction to us so can we separate the two issues can we separate the other aspects of the rental inspection program and who we're actually going to hire for it I think I think we can um, to some extent. Um, certainly, it's gonna we're gonna need to really look at that foundation of as Jessica de described. You know, how much can we take on when when we're handling it in house, um, and really have an honest conversation about that. Um, I think we can certainly start with the code um, issues because that is the first and foremost that needs to change no matter what, um, and get updated. Um, and we can work through some of the other items as we're going. My proposal would be to put out for that request for proposal once we've kind of gotten the code um, in the process of being adopted. Um, so, you know, yeah, I think there is still time to look at that um, and weigh those, weigh those things and really evaluate where we're at mm -hmm. um, and decide how much budget do we have available? What are those fees going to be? You know, we've taken um, some hard hits in the past about fees and increasing in fees when we've done that. Um, and so we recognize that there have been times where we've proposed increases that we have had to backtrack on um, and lose ground. And then it does impact what we're able to do. So, um, you know, those are all things that I've taken into consideration in putting this together. Um, but certainly things that we still will need to make final, final decisions on as we move. Your Honor, if, were you done, Bethany? No, well, that's oh, right. go ahead. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I'm just thinking that as you go through the other pieces of the program, it, I think the picture will become clearer what you need to put in the RFP, RFQ, RFP. And then you, you may find that it's, I mean, it just may surprise you like, coming up with how many hours a week you really need someone. Mm -hmm. And it may be more than you think. It may be fewer hours than you think. So, and I, I just think you're the best one to decide that for your department mm -hmm. and how to fill that role. And so that's, that's where I'm leading. I, I just think it's a separate, it's a separate issue. So I'm hoping we can get beyond that one tonight. In it seems premature to talk about it. In I know where are you, you want to set, set the stage for maybe a change in that position. I understand that, right. but I don't think, I, I'm not qualified to tell you how to run your program. Your Honor, so I wanna make sure I really understand this when we get down to the root cause of this. It's less expensive for the taxpayers to contract this service out is what you're telling me, say. So we're not going to change this position until someone retires. So therefore, we're going to take away a position that somebody in this town would like to apply for and maybe have the qualifications for and one wants to work for the city, raise their kids here, be a viable member of the city government and the community. Okay? But you're telling me that the price, the cost overrides everything. So why wouldn't we terminate both of them now the two inspectors you have, 
Why would we wait till one retires? Why wouldn't we, out, you say a firm, we'd have, they'd have more people to do this. What are we doing then? We should eliminate in-house inspectors and contract with a company today. We should get that RFQ out there today. Okay, what's the difference of eliminating one of the, the other person that's not retiring or taking away a position that somebody wants to work for us in the future? So I think with the, with the program, there are, there are portions of the administration that still need to be conducted by the city, whether it's billing um, activities for those inspections that are occurring, managing to make sure that inspections are actually occurring at the pace that we need to, that everything is getting covered, um, dealing with things like the complaints and some of those other items, our HUD program. We do have portions of the administration of those things that I think still benefit um, entirely being controlled within the department. Um, can you contract out for everything? Yes, I think that's an option that you could do. I don't think that would be the best thing for us. Um, by taking one of the positions and utilizing contracted service, like I said, I believe that it'll allow us to get things in order with the with the regular routine inspections there are still a lot of things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis between phone calls and complaints and tenant landlord issues and stuff like that that we deal with that we'll still have to deal with and so there still needs to be some staffing that is able to handle those issues but the the routine things of i have a house that needs an inspection that somebody can schedule that go do it they pay for that cost that part directly that piece i think there's an option for us to do this can we do it in house yes we can do it in house those are obviously we are um, i think if we're going to continue doing it in house we do need to continue to reevaluate what our expectations are in terms of timing um, and numbers and staffing and as jessica mentioned two isn't cutting it and so this was a way for us to look at getting those needs met um, by using some additional services. Otherwise, I think we do need to look at and think about what are the increased needs that we need to cover in order to actually achieve things. So there are options. Those are both options. I don't feel like we need to make those options as Bethany you know, pointed out. Those maybe don't need to be made tonight. Um, but those are things that as we're talking through this process, we need to fully fully examine and lay out there. Other input from others? I do hear what, what Gary is saying there. Um, I guess it, one person you're thinking it costs 68000 something like that? Uh, no, I want to get away from the 68,000. Okay, let's get away from the 68,000. Because that's a chamber number. I don't want to necessarily. I have not run through the numbers as to what, okay. um, you know, our program costs are. I mean, obviously, we have vehicles. We have maintenance. We have cell mm -hmm. phones. We have computers. You know, there are a lot of things that come along with right. a staff person beyond wages and benefits. So, okay. um, yeah, I have, I have not pushed through all that detail. If that's something that you want us to bring back and to talk about, we can certainly yeah. kind of show that. Um, more reflective. My so. thought with the contracted services is that let's say a contractor says I charge X for an inspection. That fee is paid by the city and then directly billed to the owner. So it is it is strictly I mean it is directly a pass through where we're not taking on the extra burden of that expense. Anyone else? So again, I guess I would look for maybe at this point, if you are supportive of at least the code um, process beginning, um, I'd like to get that part moving yet this month um, as we talk about some of the other things. Yep, that's what I, my motion is. Okay, is there a second? Just an interjection. Uh, I, I think that's a good idea for Bethany to separate it because I think for, uh, unless I miss my guess, in, in, in January, we're, you're, you're probably going to lose another person, maybe two through retirement. So this isn't going to be a one-step thing. This is going to be an ongoing 
question of whether we want to do this with uh, hiring people and in and, and these uh, what I call technical jobs that very few people are going to be able to just boom step in and 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 we are in a in a, a fifty to seventy five thousand uh, dollar a year job uh, so uh, the people that I'm thinking of that that I have heard from that are going to retire are are in those those jobs and we are going to face this question again whether to outsource or in-house. I mean, it's, it's not going to be a one, one, one shot stop here. And, and I think we do have to make some, some tough decisions and, 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 and down the road also uh, to accomplish what we want to. And, and I'd be the first one to, to argue uh, back and forth with you because obviously if, you, if we don't have the people to do this job, whether it be building inspector, uh, code enforcement, or whoever it is, uh, if we don't have a person out there inspecting these rentals and a kid gets killed because of the fact that uh, we haven't done our due diligence, uh, we're gonna face a, a, a wrath. Um, and, and I'm just afraid of that uh, from what I'm hearing is, is we don't have those per people and can we afford to hire four or five people to, to get the job done or outsource it. Uh, and anybody that, that, that knows some of the things that I, uh, again, I don't like outsource. Uh, I, I don't like the, uh, uh, for example, of the lawyers uh, or, or engineering or whatever. But that being said, it's uh, some, it's a necessary evil sometimes to to get the job done, and so uh, I, I think we do have some. We need to uh, do more than just this consideration tonight, and 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 so on that that content, I I would second uh, Bethany's motion to to move forward on the, the code part uh, because I think the other is going to take a little more study uh, or soul searching maybe it's the right word I don't know because it is it is we are talking about people and in, in the community and and uh, so that's my spiel for the evening Thank you. <laughs> let's call the roll on the motion then hoop yes body Hoff? yes Martin yes Thompson yes Warren? Yes. Gowdy? Yes. Okay. And let's go on to the last uh, number six quarterly meetings with the uh, Marshall County representatives. Your Honor, in the interest of time, could we possibly table this to two weeks from tonight? I'll take that as a motion to table. Is there a second? Where are we at? What's the harm, everybody? I don't think I heard a second. Well, I just will say on this, Your Honor, if I may, that all Dave Thompson, no relation, went public to the community that he wants to start this back up. So I think Councilman Lottiehoff and I would be willing to meet with Dave and find out what kind of schedule he wants to set up and and some ground rules so if the rest of you will drop me or he an email I mean date or Mike are you okay with that uh, um, actually we used to do this all the time and I I didn't realize we weren't doing it anymore um, and I guess I'm really not sure when I think I was off City Council in 2002 but all those six years we we met quarterly and sometimes it's good just to look at people eye to eye because sometimes you can kind of get some stuff done and other times yeah you just don't you just go you know what we can't do anything with that but i think it also shows it's it's kind of a good look for the taxpayers to see you know that we're all getting together i think what we would do was we would meet quarterly every other meeting was at the courthouse or here which it might not be at the courthouse for a while um or here and i think the hosting mayor or uh head of the supervisors uh 
they would give each other a call and set up their own uh, agenda, you know. So I guess in the, all's we're at, all's I'm asking right now is before we come back with a plan is if everyone would just email me their pros, cons, questions, ideas of what you want to come out of this. I mean, I don't want to go into this unless we have a goal. You know, I don't want the goal just to be a photo op, you know. I want, there's got to be some healthy things that come out of this. So I guess that's all I'm asking. Well, and, and one thing to share, the, the mayor or I, city clerk at times, um, there is a quarterly meeting of a number of governmental entities in the community of which both the city and the county are part of, along with the school district, the AEA, Waterworks, and a whole bunch more. So there is a level of communication and meetings already happening. I understand what you're saying about, um, you know, the yes. individual. The meetings. elected officials get yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the thing that I would encourage is that uh, as, as this comes back for a proposal that you are considering open meetings laws. Yes. And yes. Uh, uh, what that looks like as yeah. well um, and, and, to and ensure that everything is done as it should be per, yes. per code. And I, I will just reiterate, I, I talked to Dave today before the meeting to see if he wanted to come here and, you know, say anything. And he just said, this is just a meeting between the elected officials, you know, so we'd be, I guess, we would, we'd post it and we'd, so, yeah. yeah, we'd post it and, and, you know, follow the rules. We're not asking at this time, we're not even thinking of asking staff or anything. I mean, it's just, what can, what can this body do and that body do together moving forward? Yeah. And so my, as your staff person, I would say, if you would have anything that would be direction towards an agenda or something, it would make a lot of sense to have the city administrator in those That's in fine. order to coordinate everything yeah. that, uh, I know I'm not an elected official, but I, understand. I am the one who carries yeah. out the policy of elected officials. Well, if we're having if we're having public meetings, we need at least somebody there to Cor to take correct. notes. <laughs> well, and that's that's the other thing as well is what does this look like? Is there a set agenda yeah. that's published in advance yeah. and yeah. minutes yeah. taken? Yes. So, so those I are all concerns that I have about how those meetings could function. So all I'm asking tonight is is drop Mike or I, unless anybody else wants to join in and and, and sit in this first meeting with Dave, is uh, just drop me emails and let me know. I, I didn't have a chance to call Floyd Hartoon, uh, but I did. I uh, was able to catch Jim Lawrence to see what the history was, because in the ten years I've been on the council, there hasn't been that kind of a yeah. meeting, other than this Acer group that does meet quarterly and did. have everybody there. Uh, Jim wasn't aware of it, so then he called Randy Wetmore and said that uh, uh, Randy had said actually when Randy got here or originally there was that type of meeting going on they just didn't feel like they were getting enough accomplished to continue meeting and so it kind of died on the vine um, but from my personal standpoint I'm happy to uh, uh, explore something like this to mm -hmm. um, you know G George Fagg the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals judge from Marshtown used to joke that committees are where um, minutes are, are kept and hours are lost uh, there are a lot of meetings that the elected officials have to go to, as, as you folks know, uh, but but to the extent that somebody is reaching out to us and suggesting that there be more uh, uh, intersection, um, let's, let's explore that. Do we need to do anything else, Jessica? N no, I would, I would just want to ensure that uh, ad agendas are published and um, and mm -hmm. things are done in a in a above board way well, to comply we're, with we're definitely going to come back to you after our initial meeting with dave i mean we're going to find out you know a schedule where it's going to be you know we're i'm not doing this to waste time yeah. you know I'm, and if the first meeting if it, if it looks like it's going to be a waste of time then i'll come back and tell you that you know and i'll let everybody know when the first meeting is you know the i mean the first you know just informal talking meeting to see if we're going to have meetings does that make sense <laughs> do we do we need to bring that back to council i i would say you're setting a public meeting so it's probably something that you'll want to there needs to be communication to ensure that it's open and available to okay. to all council members to attend okay very good let's go on to public comment uh, let's see how fast I can read it. The members of the public make <coughs> comments of any item not on the agenda during this time. The speaker shall approach the microphone and state your name and address for the record. 
limit your time to three minutes unless the longer comments are authorized by the mayor. Speak directly to the mayor and the council as a whole and the mayor and council so not engage in discussion on or debate on items raised by members of the public and no action may be taken on those in order to comply with the open meetings laws. Is there anyone who would like to approach the microphone or uh, speak into their phone while we have unmuted the mics? The lines are unmuted. Heather. No one is Heather, did you want something? Did you have something <laughs> to say? Is that why you're here tonight? No. <laughs> oh. And I don't hear anybody uh, speaking up on the phone either. So that means it is now time for us to go into a closed session to talk about pending.